Hello and welcome to Tabletop Bellhop Live, episode 19, Two to Tango, Date Night Games. Coming to you from Hamilton, I'm Sean, and here with me, live and direct from Windsor, Ontario, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo T. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your game and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Let me put my years of game playing, event organizing, and game night hosting to use for you. I'd like to say hi to everyone here on Twitch in the lobby. We're here live every Wednesday night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. We love hearing from our listeners and viewers. Each week, we hope to highlight some of that feedback, both positive and negative. We get better with your comments and suggestions. And if you'd like to let us know something about the show, send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com or sean at tabletopbellhop.com. That's S-E-A-N. Chris Groff on G Plus writes about my Quiver review. Solid review. I was thinking of picking up one of these for my Dominion collection, but it wasn't large enough. Had to go to Hobby Lobby route. Then I didn't have any other games that I really needed something like this for. Well, thanks, Chris. The Quiver is not for everyone. We wouldn't suggest it just for a place to store your cards. It's definitely meant for someone who's transporting their card games often, say, to and from a Friday Night Magic or a game convention. Don't forget, head over to the blog and check out the Bellhop's review and enter for a chance to win your quiver. Michael wrote on the blog, Excellent podcast. Having only recently discovered you folks, you are now in my regular podcast rotation. Also, is the proper terminology for game process mechanics or mechanisms? Well, thanks for that awesome feedback, Michael. Mechanism versus mechanics. Uh, not quite long enough for a full topic, so I'll give you a short answer here. You'll find a variety of opinions on this, and sadly, there doesn't seem to be any standardization or a standard way that people use these terms. Now, to me, a game mechanics are made up of individual mechanisms. So a mechanism is a small part of a mechanic. So roll and write is a game mechanic, and the two main mechanisms in roll and write are rolling dice and writing things down based on the results of those dice. All right. Well, that's it for feedback this week. Thanks to everyone who took the time to email, reply, and comment. Yeah, thank you very much. And now, Tabletop Gaming Weekly, where we look back and summarize what's happened since we were last here. What games hit the Bellhops Tabletop? Every week, I like to take a look back at the games we played, uh, any events we attended, and other cool gaming stuff that's going on. You can catch the blog version of This Week in Review at tabletopbellhop.com. So I hopped in a time machine this past week. I went way back to 1989 in the land of Games Workshop and the Warhammer universe. Back then, Games Workshop took itself somewhat less seriously than they do now. The time before everything had to be grim, dark, and there was only war. When orcs were comedy, goblins were hilarious, and chaos was to be mocked. Of course it was. So one day this past weekend, it was just myself and little G. And uh, everyone else was busy or out of the house. And it's not often we get one-on-one -on -one time. So I took this as a chance to get some games off my pile of shame. So I took her aside and I said, hey, you want to try some new games? In my house, this will probably mean Xbox, PC. But when you live with a tabletop bellhop. Yeah, I, if I'm saying you want to play a new game, I'm generally speaking tabletop. I think my kids own three video games. They, they have uh, Super Smash Brothers, they have Minecraft and Disney Infinity. Oh, they also do that Scribble Knots where you like write things down and they show up. And I think that's it, and that's all we've had for like three, four years now. So yeah, video games aren't as big a play thing here. So this was my chance to get down the pile of shame, right, and play some kids' games with my daughter. So I picked out two super classic Games Workshop games. Now, they is from a series of games called The Troll Games. Uh, these were published in 1989, supposedly as something to keep your kids busy while you played Warhammer or painted your miniatures. Now, the games we got to play were Squelch and, or sorry, the games off the pile of shame were Squelch and Hungry Troll and the Gobos. Here we go. Now these games are classic. Um, I first picked up Oi, That's Me Leg 
or sorry, I should say my leg. I always say Oi, that's me leg, but the actual title is Oi, that's my leg in the 90s at a local game convention. Uh, it, it's ridiculous, silly fun. But one of the best parts of it and all the rest of the games is they come with a tape, a trollish tunes tape. And what you just heard is a clip from one of the trollish tunes tapes. Uh, these, This is a bunch of British gamers pretending to be trolls and goblins and singing. It's it's insane. They they tell bad jokes. They sing filk songs. It, it's unbelievable. Like you have to hear these things. Uh, we would play more for you, but there are copyright issues in play. Now, NG Games remembers the night we bought the game, driving home in our friend Rob's car and almost dying because we were laughing so hard at this ridiculous tape. If I remember correctly, we had to pull over right around Sam's Pizza and let the thing finish playing before we died. And to be fair, we spent a ridiculous amount of time blaring strange music from either across the pond in, in games or anime music in small cars with tape decks. It was a very different era back then. Yes. yes. <laughs> tape is a magnetic material that it rolls through and is picked up to transport audio for anyway. Um, uh, Pop's planning points. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I was thinking that. I'm like, uh, Dark Wolf in the chat pointed out tapes. We might have to explain what they are to some of the young kids. Yeah, cassette tapes. Now, these are not eight tracks, these are modern and they're two sided. Actually, if I remember correctly, these tapes are the same thing on both sides. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, I, I've had Oi, that's my leg for years. And I managed to get the other two earlier this year uh, through a trade on Google+. Plus. Um, Squelch even had its tape. So that's fantastic. Now, if anyone knows where to find Trolls in the Pantry, which is the fourth game in the series, or where to get the tape for or and or where to get the tape for Hungry Troll and the Gobos, please hit me up. Mo at tabletopbellhop.com. I really want to try to complete my set here. Now, I've had these games for a while, and here was my chance to, to play these classics with my youngest and get the kid's perspective, right? She's younger than I was when we played these. I, we, we were not little kids when I picked up Boy Dats Me Like. Uh, now, I'm just going to go on record here. There is no bad time for these games. Now, I'm not saying they aren't problematic. They aren't necessarily great games, but the history behind them just gives them a special place, especially for at least for me. Yeah, I, I admit there there is there is a heaping helping of nostalgia uh, that goes along with these games. I I was a Games Workshop fanboy, and in my opinion, this was the best time period to be into Warhammer. The 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 entire system and setting was so tongue in cheek, and you don't seem to get that anymore. So the first game of the group we played was Squelch. This is a tile laying. Carcassonne-like game where you start with a cave entrance, you draw a tile, you put the tile down after your cave entrance, and you're trying to build a big cave full of squiggly beasts. Now, modern players will recognize squigs from Warhammer. Now squigs are big red things that are all teeth, and they're kind of scary looking. Back then, squiggly beasts were all manner of weird little squiggly things. Um, if you look at pictures of this game, I've shared some online, you will see they're silly. They're, it, it's not a horrific bunch of teeth that looks like a piranha on legs uh so you get your squiggly beasts you grab them and you're going to put the tile down and then the next player is going to grab a tile and put the tile down in their cave and go around comes back to you when you place your second squiggly beast the colors have to match so these are the edges are either red or blue and when you play it you have to either match blue to blue red to red very simple the other tiles you can grab are gobos or goblins modern parlance back then they called them gobos when you grab a gobo it goes down anywhere and it protects the squigs that's past it, right? So you have three squigs and a gobo. Well, those three squigs are safe. But what are they safe from? Well, that's the next type of tile, which is a troll. When you draw a troll, you play it in someone else's cave. And then it goes and squishes all the squigs with a squelch, squelch, squelch until it gets to a gobo and it stops. Then there's one other type of tile called the terrible troll. And when that comes out, you basically play spoons where everyone playing the game has to try to grab these tough gobo tiles. And there's one less than the number of players. So one player is going to be left out with no tough gobo. And then the terrible troll wrecks their entire cave and squelches everything, including all the gobos, all the squigs and all the trolls. So we aren't talking about games from the golden age of board games here or even anything they spent much effort on. 
These yeah. were literally just to distract kids while dad played 40 K. Yeah, this, this is, it's bad. Like th this game is, is not a good game. The terrible troll thing is just dumb. You have this tile that comes up every game and it means for one player that all their work is lost. No matter how far or how well they played or how well they did, it's the person with the terrible trolls out of the game. Terrible. It's it's not fair, it's fun. So I've got a couple ways to fix this game to make it better. One, get rid of the terrible troll. Leave it in the box, it's dumb, skip it. I'd rather play with miss a turn and roll a move any day versus some random thing that ruins the game. Now the other thing, is their, the choices don't matter. So when you're playing, you're going to draw a tile and you're going to play it and it goes in the next spot. Or you're going to play it and it has to go red. Like, I would say 85% of the time your decisions don't matter. And then the other 15% of the time, yes, you have a choice to put it left or right, but it doesn't actually matter for the results of the game. Maybe 1% of the time you actually have a choice that may make a difference. So as long as there's a game and I'm looking at you, Masters of the Universe, for not a game, there are always house rules to fix problems like this. Yeah, there, again, I have a fix for this. We've already thrown out the terrible troll, so now what you do is you give everyone a hand to three tiles. Now you have choices. Do you play the squig you have in your hand, or do you play a gobo now and protect what you've already played? You've got two squigs and a gobo, huh? Do you push your luck and try to play those two squigs hoping your opponent doesn't have a troll? Or if you're the opponent with the troll and you're like, huh, he's played a couple squigs, does he have any more? Do I squish him now or do I wait? You actually have choices that matter. So to be fair, this was probably uh, more that the people were uh, who pushed this game out were expected to work towards. I mean, they, they, no one was expected to, to put out a high quality class game. This was a PR <laughs> push. Um, they were probably, they may have been written by PR people and not game designers per se, because the game designers were all working over at Warhammer, uh, uh, fantasy and 40 K. Um, so, you know, we're not blaming games work out for this. We know why they put them out, but that doesn't mean we can't have fun with them now that they are out. That's true. Uh, it's Andy. I forget the last name designed all of them. Well, the three I own, all three that I own are designed by the same person. As far as I can tell, he's a real game designer. And I got to admit of the three that I played, Squelch is the least game like the more, most random. The other ones do get a little better. So Hungry Troll and the Gobos is the next one we played. Now this is basically war. So it's draw a card, your opponent draws a card, whoever has the highest card wins. Except in this case, every card has four stats, four values. Now your cards are mostly trolls and gobos, and they have stats for how hungry they are, how tough they are, how stupid they are, and how naughty they are. Now the stats range from not, not, so not tough, not stupid, to very, very, so very, very stupid. And you got stuff in between, so not very, and very, and so on. So one example is, tee hee, I'm Gabby Gobo, I'm not hungry, not very tough, very stupid, and very, very naughty. There are also four special cards that have stats at extremely, one for each of the four stats. So you have a dragon, a wizard, a squig, and in total Games Workshop style, a really badass looking tons of spiky bits chaos warrior. Because, well, it's Games Workshop. Oh, sorry, he's called a red knight in this game. So when players draw their cards, instead of just my three beats your two, you pick a stat. And then you compare it to the other players. So you're like, I'm Gabby Gobo. And you're going to say, I'm very, very naughty because, well, it's the highest number on your card. And then your opponent's going to look and see how naughty she they are and say, oh, I'm not naughty. Well, Gabby Gobo wins and takes both cards. There's only 36 cards total. Uh, whoever has the most cards at the end wins. Ties work just like War, where you're just going to draw another card. And you have to compare the same stat. So if you're already comparing how naughty you are, you're going to keep comparing naughty on new cards. Uh, it's pretty simple. Once all the cards are out, count how many cards you have. Black cards are worth two instead of one. Whoever's most points wins. I, I don't know. You keep saying Gabby Gobo is very, very naughty, and I'm picturing some late night 1-900 number. I'm Gabby Gobo, and I'm very, very naughty. <laughs> I, I shared a picture of this card. If you follow my Twitter, um, it, there, there's definitely something they're alluding to there. It is a goblin in a ye little yellow dress. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Uh, that is something else about these games is Games Workshop is famous for throwing in the adult humor. So just kind of like watching the Muppets, but a little more in your face than that. That There, there are jokes that the adults are going to get a kick out of this. 
Yep. So this game is simple. It's to the point. But again, it's very thematic, dripping with those early games workshop feels. Yeah, definitely. Uh, it's not a bad game. Uh, Little G loved this one uh, so much so that when her sister came home from uh, she was over at my mother-in-law's uh, was like, oh, my God, Big G, Big G, you got to play this game. You got to play this game. Um, so she was all obsessed with this. Now, I thought it was cool because it gave me a complete flashback to Citadel combat cards. Now, these were playing cards, I guess you call them cards, um, that had pictures of Citadel miniatures on them, like awesome painted, like the heavy metal team best looking miniatures out there. And they had six different sets. So there was like Warriors, uh, instead of 40K, it was called Space War for some reason. There was an orc set and so on. And they each had cards and each card had five stats, I think, on them. And you did the same game. So... What it was, was each of the six sets had a different game, and one of them, I couldn't tell you which of the six, had this game in it. It was war. It was, you each drew a combat card, you picked one of the five stats, and then you compared those stats. I thought that was interesting. So that actually came out the year before this did. So they basically took the combat card mechanic and threw it into this silly troll game. So at this point... That was it for the new games, right? We tried the two new games, but then Little G is like, but we got to play Oi, That's My Leg, too, because it's it's the, from the same company, and it's got the same art, and I want to be a gobo, and I want to build trolls, which is pretty cool. Like, we had played three rounds of each of the previous games, so we just played six games in a row of these silly gobo games, and she was aching to play another game. Uh, it gives me the happy feels in my heart to know that another generation is picking up and enjoying these games. No, it's true. I, I, I have to push it on them. Hopefully, hopefully they keep them in good enough shape. Maybe they can share them with their kids in, sometime in the future. So, oi, that's me, leg. You're playing gobos, trying to build, collect troll bits, heads, bodies, and legs, and assemble your own trolls. Note the tongue-in-cheek humor of Games Workshop, because when you really think about that, it's pretty kind of twisted. But anyway, the point is, whoever makes two full trolls first wins. Uh, it's a roll and move game where you're moving around a board that's basically two overlapping figure eights. There's a troll who, of course, is mixing a leg, is hopping around the center ring. And again, we're not talking about anything difficult, but it's fun and, and probably actually one of the, the stronger of the of the three games. Um, just no, because I... it's, an, it's an enjoyable uh, and there's things to do. And again, the art, again, really, in, in, in some ways, the art makes all of these games worthwhile. Uh, regardless of the actual game mechanics, um, they they had, uh, if nothing else, they had an amazing stable of artists to to draw from at the time. Oh, I agree. So in Oi, That's Me Leg, you're moving around the board trying to collect bits. Every now and then when you collect bits instead, you get junk. When you get junk, you get to play it on another person's troll to mess it up because you can't win a game with a troll made of junk. You can also get a card that says Oi, and then you get to go, Oi, that's me head, and you steal the head from another player. There's a bunch of take this style mechanisms. And then it has one of the worst things that's ever been put in a board game, which is the equivalent of the jail in Monopoly. If the troll catches you, you go to jail and you have to roll a five or six on your turn or you miss a turn. I, what more is there to say? These were kids teasers to get them into a mood. Uh, that was G that was games workshop at the time, a very British humorous take on the fantasy theme. Yeah, I agree. This That's also it, right? Like, yeah, part of it was to get your kids, keep your kids busy while you played Warhammer. But the other part was to get the kids to start loving goblins and trolls and the whole Games Workshop universe. So, yeah, Oi That Me Leg has some terrible mechanics. It's got roll and move and especially the jail rules where you're going to miss turns. But somehow this game's still fun. My kids love it. Like, my the oldest big g cackles so much when her sister gets stuck in the jail and can't get out for three or four turns in a row like she's laughing so much that it almost makes me want to like that mechanic but almost like no i, I can't do it so we tried a few fixes over the years so instead of moving missing a turn move half speed or when you're in jail you don't escape or and you don't escape it makes the troll mad, so you get to move them. So on your turn, you're rolling a die and actually doing something. Uh, we also tried it so that the control of the troll moves every turn, so a different player can move them, and the troll doesn't have to stick to the central track. And then the best way we found to play was to combine that so the person in the jail can control the troll, so again, they have something to do on their turn. Uh, these all work, They they. but you know what? We have enough fun with the base game. I don't think there's any particular reason to mess 
with the game. Yeah, it's got some dated mechanics, but what do you expect? It's 1989, and it's kids' games for ages 6 and up or so. So that was my trip back to the early days of Games Workshop, back when they had a sense of humor. I don't want to say it that bad. I, I got to admit, like, bashing on Games Workshop's popular nowadays. Since they got their new CEO, they are doing a lot of awesome stuff recently, though I haven't seen them go back to this style. I do miss the aesthetic and the humor from those days. Well, the, uh, the, the UK are not in the most humorous of moods right now. Maybe when Brexit is passed, the, uh, <clears throat> the old sense of humor can come back to the... Uh the Imperium. Now remember, you can head over to the webpage at tabletopbellhop.com and click on On the Table to read more about these classic games. We record the show live Wednesday nights at 9.30 Eastern on Twitch, and we encourage people to drop in and take part in our chat room in the lobby. Thanks to our moderator, Angie Games. Uh, tonight, we've had a little bit of chatter about uh, Games Workshop going on, uh, a chant of Blood for the Blood God, and... Uh, <laughs> Uh, it's gotta some, happen. Some some GW bashing, as we as we were mentioning, happens from times to time. From time to time, uh, met people mentioning that troll junk is not the greatest visual. Uh, I, as I said, there's there's some the naughty naughty go, gobo isn't yeah. the best either. So there's definitely some some jokes to be made there, or jokes that have been made to realize some some single entendres. <laughs> And uh, Shazdar is mentioning that uh, we can use some more visuals. Uh, maybe uh, maybe we can start doing some uh, snaps of uh, gameplay. Maybe some of your pull some of your Twitter feed uh, images and drop them in as we're talking about stuff, uh, just as a, as a way to give people a little visual as to what we're uh, what we're discussing. Something we yeah, can we look at. I, hmm. As long as it's we your images, it. we can use it. So. Yeah, Im images we could use. I don't know, but I noticed he said uh, beginning playthroughs to go along with the podcast. Like, I, I think we'd have to stream that separate, or if we if we ever split this into two th streams where we're doing the week in review separate from the question, maybe. But as it is, we have a hard time trying to fit into an hour and a half time line as it is. If we're going to play a couple rounds of a game every time, I think that's going to make it way too long. We do need to do Lord live streams of games in general. That is something I would like to push more towards. Uh, are we uh, planning on live streaming anything on uh, New Year's? Because I think I'm going to be down there. I thought about it. I was going to mention that once we get to announcements, which is coming up soon, that we may want to talk about it. We'll see. Okay. Uh, I know the uh, misdirected Mark people are talking about doing something, but that's fine. That's their yep. own thing. Absolutely. But I, I thought about it. It's one of those things. I don't see why not. Yeah, we're we're there and we can. We have the, we have the technology to make it possible. Yes. Well, we hope we have the technology <laughs> to make it possible. We True. didn't for the uh, the launch party, so we'll there see is, how it goes. For there years. is that. You can find us all across the web now, and we grow by the support of listeners and viewers like you. So please take a minute to subscribe to our content on your favorite platform and help us spread our gaming advice to the world. Sign up to receive Tabletop Bellhop Weekly in your inbox. Every Wednesday, we'll be sending out an email recapping all the content we've released in the week previous. Blog posts, new podcast episodes, reviews, and anything else we create. You can sign up at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com or go over to tabletopbellhop.com webpage where you'll find a spot to subscribe in the sidebar. Uh, for those of you who are live, you've got exactly one week to enter our Quiver giveaway. Head over to reviews on the blog. Look for it. For those of you listening on the podcast, that one day, the day it drops. If you're listening to the day this came out, you've got two days to register. If you're listening on Wednesday, it's your last chance. The contest ends December 12th at 11.59 p.m. Eastern. This is your last chance to get a great piece of gamer luggage. Now, with the holidays approaching, I invite everyone to check out our gamer gift guides, which include a ton of suggestions to buy the game in your life that aren't just more games. Your gamer friends likely buy many of the games they want for themselves, and buying something they'll enjoy or don't already have in their collection may be tough. This is a list of items that make great gifts because people may not be buying them for themselves. Also, be sure to click on Tabletop Game Deals while on the blog and check out a list of some of the best online deals. We're currently updating this list daily and have deals from 18 different online vendors. 
Now, every week as part of Throwback Thursday, I'm going to resurrect an old piece of gaming content, something I wrote years ago on another platform. I'll be republishing the original article, then adding my thoughts to the topic. Has my opinion changed in the intervening years? This week, I'm taking a look back at the godfather of deck builders, Dominion. That's a deck builder, not deck construction. Yes, check out our mechanics episode to see the difference where we tell you the mechanisms of deck building versus deck construction. So I first reviewed Dominion back in 2010. Uh, It was the new hotness back then. As expected, I think most people know Dominion. I don't think I'm, I think I'm preaching to the choir. I'm assuming most people listening and watching this show know of Dominion. Um, As would be expected back when this came out, I was blown away. It took the building of Magic the Gathering, the deck building, the before the game fun, and made that the game, made that a standalone game. It was totally new and totally mind-blowing back then. I mean, I, I think most of us remember, or most of uh, any, anyone who's played any CG, CGs, remember that the idea of sitting down with that full wealth of cards in front of you and trying to put together that deck that was going to stand out, that was going to take down whatever you were playing up against. If you knew that your friends, you know, had that brand new green deck that was mm-hmm. causing you trouble, uh, you know, what were you going to build to make, to, to come out on top? Um, and this is, this is that, but gamified. Now, as I noted, I don't think there are many people listening that don't know what Dominion is, but I'll summarize it quickly. Everyone starts the game with the same deck of 10 cards. Everyone's deck is identical. On the table in front of everyone are laid out other cards that players can acquire. They call that the market. These cards in the market include coins and victory point cards, and then random sets of cards that swap each time you play. Now, this is where the expansions and various versions of Dominion came come in, because it's more cards to mix in with those random sets. Now, for those of you who might not be familiar with Dominion, and I'm sure there are some out there, uh, the modern version that more people may know is Ascension, um, which is the, the newer, sweeter deck building game that a lot of people are playing. And... and We'll talk about it again later. Yeah, that does come up in a bit. So on your turn, you're going to draw five of your ten cards. Well, once you have more than ten cards, you're drawing five of your cards. You're going to use one of those cards that has the word action on it. Then, after you've done your action, you're going to count out the money cards in your hand. And then you're going to use that to buy one card from that market I mentioned. Then you discard everything you didn't use, including the new cards you bought. When your deck runs out, you reshuffle. So next time you go through your 10 cards, you're going to have more cards because you just bought more and your deck builds. That's the whole point. That's basically it. So in Dominion, you keep playing until a set number of those stacks of cards run out. Some of the cards you buy are worth victory points. And once those decks run out, whoever has the most of those victory point cards wins. Not complex, but the uh, the cards that are available through the original game and through expansions allow for quite a variety of play within that uh, simple system. Yeah, very much so. There, there is a, a Dominion blew up. It's, it's not a small set of games. There are a lot of expansions and a lot of sets. Now, the game itself, is a, it's a fairly simple concept, right? But it works really well because where the game comes in is these cards, right? Like the basic rules, I just taught you the basic rules, but each of those cards is going to break the rules in some way. They're going to change the basic action. So they're going to give you more actions. They're going to let you draw more cards. They're going to let you swap cards or steal cards from other players, etc. So it is the perfect example of an exception-based game. Simple rules made more interesting through exceptions. Yeah, and again, we've talked about this time and time again, over and over on the show, a simple game that builds complexity from that simple rule set um, is really the, the lasting and stronger system. Those are the ones that, that really stay and, uh, and have the staying power when it comes to games. Yeah, I definitely agree. Though there are some popular complicated games, but they don't tend to hit the table as often. So Dominion back in the day really was a great game. Like, in my opinion, it is still the perfect example of a pure deck builder. Now, the thing is, the industry has moved on since then. Because now deck building is part of a game. It's not a game on its own. It's something you use in your game to do more. 
Like, I don't want to just use my cards to buy more cards that let me buy more cards and hope I bought the right cards versus someone else, because that's pretty much what you do in Dominion. I want more than that. And that's where and that's where things like uh, Ascension have moved on and added the combat mechanic in as well as the card purchasing mechanic. Yeah, exactly. I want to play cards to kill monsters, or I want to gain XP, or I want to get victory points, or I want to build an army forming a tableau of units and conquer worlds. No core worlds. I want to upgrade my team of orcs with star players benching useless players. Uh, it's Blood Bowl team manager. Uh, Dominion for me just isn't enough to keep me interested nowadays. Yeah, it's... Uh... The, the game mechanic is fantastic, and uh, it, was an, it was an original, but uh, it's just a mechanic now. It's not really as much of a game on its own. Yeah, I agree. Now, I still do own it. I haven't gotten rid of Dominion, and there's a good reason for this. For one, I play in public a lot, and I play with new gamers often, and this is the perfect game to introduce someone to deck building. Being the godfather and the most pure example of deck building, if you want to teach your new group core worlds or you want to teach them Ascension, break out Dominion first, play a quick game of that to teach the basic concepts. So when you move on to Ascension and having to worry about combos and events and having power and mana, it's a lot easier if they have that base. And Dominion is perfect still for teaching that base. The other thing is it's like Catan this way. is For one, almost everyone knows it. For second, it's really easy to teach, and it's extremely competitive at four players, so it is perfect for tournament play. It is a great game for... I, I've used it every single Great Canadian Board Game Blitz I've ever run. I have used both Dominion and Intrigue, because they're both standalone games, and that's why I still have both. So I still have it, and I don't plan on getting rid of it, because it serves a purpose in my collection. As Dark Wolf points out in the chat room, it's a gateway game. Yes, it is. Each episode, we look to answer one or more of your game, gaming, or game night questions. You can send questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com, or you can head over to the webpage, tabletopbellhop.com, and click on Ask the Bellhop. Uh, social media works, too. Uh, we're pretty much everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Uh, well, I prefer if questions come through the website because they're easier to track and they end up on an Excel file. I'm not going to say no to a question asked anywhere else. Today on Ask the Bellhop, we're answering the question, what are some great two-player games for date night? That's right. Uh, the most popular post on the blog on TabletopBellhop.com by far is the one about two-player games. It gets the most hits. It's the biggest entry point to the website. Um, it's the one that um, Google Analytics ranks the highest. Um, it's also the question or the content, the question that I get the most follow-up questions on. And those follow-up questions tend to be people looking for a filter, more specific answers. So I need a two-player game to play with my kids, or I need a two-player game that fits in at lunchtime at work. Now, of those questions, the one that gets asked the most often are people looking for games for couples to play, to play with their spouses, or to play during date night. Now, solo, pl solo players, with some exception, tend to prefer video or mobile games, but once you get two players, you're in the physical realm. Yes, you can <laughs> play video games, but you lose a lot of the connection and the social aspect, and who actually likes split-screen gaming or sitting at across the table staring at their phone all night? Yeah, I don't see much split-screen gaming anymore. I think gone are the days of the networked Xboxes and the four split-screen. You don't seem to have that anymore. I, I kind of miss that, in a way. Though trying to play um, Borderlands two-player did not go very well with my wife and I. <laughs> so since writing the original Ask the Bellhop article on this, on, on date night gaming, I realized I approached this question in a totally mechanical fashion. Um, I, it was all about the practicality of playing games when you're out with your date. I got to admit, I totally left out anything about romance or getting to know your partner or relationships. Um, this wasn't actually intentional, but now that I think more about it, I think I'm going to stick to the practical. I know games. I 
don't necessarily know relationships. Yes, I've been married for a long time, so I guess I know enough. Uh, but I'm not going to give you advice on that. I'm going to let you figure out the romantic parts, and I'm just going to talk about the practical parts of playing games. We won't suggest wine pairings or entrees, but as always, watch out for those sticky finger foods when you're gaming, and go easy on the garlic. <laughs> True enough. Ribs, there's one thing I learned. I think it was like one of the first date. Ribs are not a good date food. There, I did give my one piece of dating advice. They're also not a good food for games. So if you're on a date night where you're going to play games, just, just skip the ribs. So what I mean by practical is that the main thing I think about when about to go out on date night is where we're going. And from figuring out where we're going, I figure out two things. Uh, one is how much room we're going to have and how much time we're going to have to play games. Then I use those two criteria, space and time, to figure out what games to grab. Now, we have to remember that the bellhop married a gamer. This list is generally <laughs> assuming that both parties are into the board game hobby, and it's up to you to judge the level of interest and knowledge of your potential game partner for these suggestions. Very true. I did note a couple times on this list if games were great for new gamers, so it is mentioned. So where you are for your date is going to determine how much room you have. So if you're at a pub and there's bar seating, you're not going to have much room. Or you may be at a coffee shop with nice huge tables and lots of lighting. Similarly, that coffee shop may also have no problem with you sitting there three to four hours as long as you keep buying coffee. But then again, you could be ordering a full meal, so you want something quick to play before the appetizers show up. So I've broken this list into sections, as we've done on most of our game recommendation episodes. We'll be looking at small footprint, quick game time, small footprint, medium game time, medium footprint, quick game time, medium footprint, medium game time, large footprint, medium game time, and large footprint, long game time. Now, on one quick note, these are a mix of two-player only games and games that play more players but are great with two. I didn't just limit it to two-player games, and I didn't limit it otherwise. So starting off with small footprint, quick game time. Now, you're talking small coffee shop tables played very quickly, way less than half an hour. We're looking at like 15-minute games most of the time. They may stretch up to half an hour if you're just learning the game. Now, one thing to note, these games are good pretty much everywhere. Even if you do have a big table and lots of time, there's no reason you can't play these games. You could even whip these out, waiting for a table on a busy Friday night. Just grab a spot at the bar and play till they call your name. No more sitting around grumbling about how long you have to wait for your table. That is very true, and we have actually done that before. So number one game, and this is probably my strongest recommendation, the game my wife and I have played the most at the variety of places over the years, from bars to pubs to cafes to, I think, once at a Reddit wedding reception, is the game Hive. Now, this is a baggie full of Bakelite hex tiles with bugs on them. The gameplay itself is fairly simple. It's kind of chess-like. It's an abstract game. You are going to play these bug tiles onto the board, and every turn you either play a new bug or you move one that's on the board. No, I'm saying board. There is no board. You are just playing the tiles onto your table. It doesn't require a board. So the board grows as you play the tiles, or the tiles are the board. You're building a hive, so I'll say the term on the hive. So you're going to play tiles onto the hive, or you're going to move a tile that's already in the hive. And then the goal is to surround the opponent's queen bee. And the neat part is that all the bugs move different. So spiders move around the outside edge, but can only move three at a time. Grasshoppers jump over the hive. Uh, pill bugs can crawl up on top and so on. It's fairly simple to learn the moves. Maybe your first time you play, you might want to need to keep the rule book out. But once you've got it, you've got it. It's quick and easy. And no board at all with and no little fiddly pieces and chits makes this a great play anywhere option. It is. There's even a meme on uh, Board Game Geek where people play Hive in unusual places. So people have played it while scuba diving and on top of Mount Vesuvius. And it's, it's a thing. Uh, number two is the Duke. So it's another chest like where you're trying to learn the moves of various people pieces you're on a six by six grid the goal is to capture your opponent's duke the neat part in this game is the way the pieces move is that it's right on the tiles 
And then when you move your piece, you flip it and the moves, they do change, which is really brilliant, a really neat mechanic. Even if you hate chess, check this game out. One of the best abstract games I own. It's just slightly bigger than Hive. And to be honest, it replaced Hive for my wife and I when we got it. We basically put Hive away and put the Duke in our glove box and bring it. I love the Duke. We've mentioned this one a few times, and you really can't go wrong. From beginners to experts, it's got great gameplay. Um, up next, we're going to stick to abstract games, I guess, because small, quick games tend to be abstract chess-like games. Uh, this one's on Onitama. And I must really dig these style of games because I own so many of them. Again, if you're not a big chess fan, you don't have to be. This is a neat martial arts battle with um, five folk on each side. you got four monks and a sensei. You're doing a martial arts battle. There's two different ways to win. One where you take out all the opponents, and the other is get your sensei into the opponent's temple. Uh, the neat part in this game is instead of having to learn the moves for the pieces, the moves are on cards. There's only ever five cards, and it's perfect information. Really cool. When you use your move, you end up giving it to your opponent. A lot of strategy going on there. Small, easy to learn, simple, but not simplistic. Very true. Now, here's the one for the, the non-gamers, right? Here's, here's your quick, simple game that pretty much anyone can play. This is a game called Bananagrams. It comes in a little zipper banana. It has a bunch of tiles, and it basically looks like Scrabble. You're going to form words from your tiles, basically make your own little personal crossword. The neat part is you're each building your own. It's a timed game. You have your own set of tiles, and the first one to use up all their tiles wins. What I like about this one is you win by using up the tiles, not by how big your words are. You're not going to make anyone feel, you know, upset because they didn't have the fancy words. It's uh, it's great that way. And it comes in a banana. How can you go wrong? What kind of <laughs> it's you've got a you know, immediate conversation starter right there as you pull a banana out of something and put it down. On the table. <laughs> <I> was, <sighs> is that a banana in your pocket? Well, yes, it is. <laughs> so here's a new one. Uh, this is called the mind. This fits. This this goes to the 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 romantic thing in a way because this is all about connecting with your partner. You are trying to play cards in order. The the cards are literally just cards numbered one to a hundred. You each draw a card. Then you can't talk. You're not supposed to signal each other, and you have to play the cards in order. Uh, so if I have like a 52, I'm gonna wait a bit and hope. Like, yeah, I gotta wait a little while. And okay, you haven't played yet. Okay, hopefully you have like a 70, and I'm gonna play my card. Um, and then the next round, if you win, you then play with two cards, and then three cards, and then four cards, and it gets harder and harder. It's really neat because you can't talk. It's it's a really interesting thing. There's a little bit more mechanics into it having to do with throwing stars which I have no idea what that has to do with the mind. But basically, a really simple game. You can even print and play your own copy. You can get the rules online. Plus, it's cheap if you can actually find a copy, but it's popular enough. It's pretty much out of stock everywhere. Now, I'm not familiar with this one, but I noticed BGG recommends it recommends four players for it. It, it plays well with two, though? It plays fine with two. I would say it's probably better with four. The more people involved, the better the game is. But it plays fine with two. And like I said, I think the good part here is the, the whole you're trying to make a connection, right? Plus, everyone I've seen playing this game does laugh. And you have those moments where you're like, ah! oh, no, right? Like, Or, yes, yes, we did it. And you're like high-fiving each other. It does seem to go that well. Excellent. Now, next up, small footprint, medium game time. A bit longer, up to 45 minutes, good for after the meal when you don't have a lot of room or when staying for a bit and having drinks or dessert. Sounds good. So this is another one. I'm going to relationship building. There is this really odd card game called And Then We Held Hands. It's weird. It's hard for me to describe. The theory of the game is the two players are in a relationship trying to work through problems and end up on the same page by the end of the game. Now, physically, this is a board with point-to-point -point movement on it in concentric circles, and you're trying to meet in the middle. And the way you're doing that is by playing cards, and the cards have to match the colors you are on. Now, the funky bit is the cards are two-sided, and you can play your cards or your opponent's. So you can look across the table and see what your opponents have. Now, like the mind, you're not allowed to talk. So you're trying to get on the same page and figure out the strategy your opponent's doing. There's also some really neat stuff done with splaying cards. So depending on how you lay them out, they're all like laid out left to right or right to left, changes what the cards do. It's very unique, very odd game, but we're checking out. 
Uh, it's another simple game that creates a lot of complexity with uh, sub subtly beautiful. It's not it's not fancy, but it's it's very nice. One thing I noticed, uh, there's a lot of people who have done some really interesting uh, ways of using the print and play um, and, oh. and really make it way more transportable. I saw people using like in the inside of manila folders so that you just got a manila folder with all your cards and everything in it. You drop it on the table, open up the folder, there's the gameplay and all your cards are good to go. Um, so, you know, if, if you're looking for the, the cheaper version, the print and play, uh, has some real interesting, uh, possibilities. That's probably uh, worth checking out too. Cause the other thing is I, as often happens on this show, because I like to talk about older games is I'm pretty sure this one's well out of print. So that may be the only way you're going to get a copy of, and then we held hands. Um, up next is a game called red seven. Uh, this could be in the top category. It could be very quick if you stick to the basic rules. But there are advanced rules, and I think the game's better with the advanced rules. This game's really simple to explain, kind of like Flux, where it's just you draw a card and play a card. This is, on your turn, you have to win. And if you don't, you lose. And the way that starts is the beginning of the game, it's whoever has the highest card's the winner. So if you don't have the highest card, you're losing. So you have to do something about that. So you either play a higher card, or you play a card to change the rule. And then when your turn's done, you have to be winning. Then it goes to the next person. Now it's their turn. They have to win or they lose. It sounds funkier than it is. Like seeing it in play, it just clicks. It's a brilliant game. It's one of the best games I own. And for a small deck game, it's one of the most brain-burning games where you're trying to figure out what to play next, especially with the advanced rules, because normally you win by playing all your cards, but if you use the advanced rules, they're scoring, and then certain cards are out of the deck, so you're trying to remember what's out of the deck and what's not, and then the second advanced rule gives special abilities to all the odd-numbered cards. I really dig this game. Now, I, I hadn't run across this game before, but what a deep concept. Seven card games in one. There are so many games where you, you know, you see it advertised on the pack, three games in one, buy this and you can play badminton, tennis and, you know, but this is actually seven different card games at the same time, essentially. Um, you know, you're just, it's you're switching what the game is depending on what, how you're going to win. Um, you're actually, you know, they, they describe it in, in as, as changing the game you're playing. So it's, you're either playing highest card wins or you're playing, you know, whatever. And you're, so you're changing the game in order to make yes. yourself win. Yes, so at the end of your turn, you have to win. If you're yeah. not winning this game, you change it. Yeah. So as I said, it's a very unique concept, very good game. I Again, this does play better with four, but it plays great with two. So now we're getting into fancy, cool-looking games. Santorini, beautiful game with lots of plastic. Uh, this is another abstract game. So you've got this like 3D board that's showing the island of Santorini, and you've got plastic pieces and if anyone knows that Alice Santorini is these uh very white buildings with blue roofs it's it's an actual real world place and the game tries to recreate that look so all it is is you move your guy and after you move you build up one level any of the eight squares around you if it's already up you build up higher buildings go to a top of four levels your goal is to get one of your two dudes to the third floor of the building and prevent your opponent from doing the same uh once you learn the basics of the game they added additional rules in this new new shiny version from Loxley Games that makes uh, the gods, because it's a Greek setting, so you have Zeus and Athena, and each of those breaks the rules in some way. Uh, really simple to learn. Like, this one I can probably teach in about three minutes with physical pieces in front of me, where I can just be like, look, you do this, and you're like, oh, okay, makes sense. It's really simple to learn. Doesn't take a lot of room, it's just this one grid. Plus, if you're going out to date night, you can leave the plastic base and all that at home and just bring the board and the towers. Yeah, it's you know, this is one that may be up to different people. I'm not sure if I'd want to bring this one out just because of the pieces, but uh, it's it's certainly not little fiddly pieces. It's not you're not dealing no. with a, a bunch of little chits and meeples. They're they're notable, they're sizable, chunky pieces. So it's not like you're necessarily going to lose them. The other one too is um, if you're shy about playing games, don't bring this game out because everyone's going to be looking at your table because they're like, what the heck are they doing over there? Because this one gets fairly tall. So here's one that I completely forgot about on the blog, which is kind of weird because back when Enchi Games and I were dating, I would walk downtown and meet her at the coffee exchange on her lunch break to play this game. And that game was Lost Cities. This is a card game with a board, but the first thing I'd suggest if you don't have space is toss out the board because you don't really need it. It's just rows of cards and it makes sure you put them in the right spot. Uh, it's a push your luck set collection game with a really badly tacked on exploration theme. Um, a lot of the game is trying to read your opponent and trying to remember what cards have been discarded and try to figure out what they're going for 
without them figuring out what you're trying to go for. It's another one simple to teach and learn. It's maybe one step above a gateway game. So maybe like play a couple games, uh, card games or stuff first before diving into this one. But if anyone's at all a gamer has played any hobby games, they can dive right into this one. Now, be aware that there is a Lost Cities board game as well, but it is actually several iterations of re-implementation of this concept beyond this. Uh, yeah. So there's Lost Cities and then there's Lost Cities board game. We're specifically talking about Lost Cities. Yeah, and actually even now there is now Lost Cities Rivals, which makes it a four-player game, which is, again, something completely different. We're talking about the original Lost Cities card game that's got to be on like the 12th printing by now. This is an older game that's still good. So up next is medium footprint quick game time. So these games are nice and quick, usually under half an hour, but do need some room. And remember, if you're at a restaurant, there's always other things on the table. So in your head, you may be like, oh, Factory House has these nice big tables, but don't forget they have the nice serving thing. And then there's the thing showing the desserts. And then there's the table topper over here and you got all your silverware and your centerpiece and so on. Now, a three by three table is probably great for these games. But remember, you're going to need more room if there's lots of add ons. Like think of going to IHOP with the 18 different bottles of syrup, right? Or all the sauces at your local barbecue place. Now, we spoke about this some in episode 12, but please don't go rearranging things on your own. Talk to a server. They'll likely help you out if they can, uh, but they'll absolutely appreciate the check-in with them before you uh, start moving things around. Yes, very true. So the top one, top recommendation, this is one that I would put higher on the list if it was easier to fit on the table, is Patchwork. The problem with Patchwork is it's a polyomino game, and you have to lay every polyomino out in a circle around the board or some type of circular place, even if it's not around the board, because you're moving clockwise around it when you're drafting. So you can only draft the next three tiles. So you can't just make stacks of them. You're not drawing, you're drafting. Um, so this takes room. Now, these polyominoes in this game represent scraps of fabric, and some of these pieces of fabric have buttons on them, and you're going to use this fabric to make a quilt. Now, each piece you draft costs buttons. Buttons are your money, and they cost time. And on time, you're going to move down a time track, and when you pass certain spots, you get money based on how many buttons your quilt has. The other neat thing about the time track is, is like Takedo, the person who's further back on the track goes next. So if you buy a big expensive tile that fills up a bunch of your quilt, it's probably going to take you a long time, which is going to let the other player probably get multiple plays in. This is a brilliant game and one of my strongest recommendations, but realize you need room. I almost wish they made a mini version with smaller tiles somehow, because it's surprising how much room this game takes. It's a small box, but having to lay out every one of those polyominoes takes room. Well, surprise, surprise, they have Patchwork Express. Uh, which takes up less space, uh, but it uses a more simplistic rule set, set with a shorter gameplay. So uh, they describe it as a shallower gameplay in most of the reviews. Uh, but yeah, it does the, exist. The reviews I read on that uh, made me not even want to pick it up. So I just want smaller. Don't make it yeah. simpler, just smaller. So up next uh, is Agricola, All Creatures Big and Small. We talked about Agricola, Misery Farm, a couple episodes back on our Agricola. look back. Yes, Agricola. Sorry, Agricola. We talked about that too. Agricola, All Creatures Big and Small. Uh, we also mentioned this game, which takes the misery out of Misery Farm. Uh, right now, you're just looking at the animal husbandry part. It's you're building fences and you're raising animals. It's still a pretty solid game fairly deep worker placement game. Now, this is one I do not recommend for newcomers. This is for gamers with other gamers that have some gaming XP. Now, for those into heavier games, this is probably going to sate your urge more than many of the other games on our list. Now, just be aware of the small pieces to manage at the table in this one. For this, if you're going to be bringing it places, I would recommend an insert of some sort uh, if you are finding yourself bringing it out, there's a lot of options out there from do it yourself to Etsy to uh, Meeple Realty's Farmer's Barnyard. Very true. I've got little, um, picked them up at the dollar store, Tupperware like things, keeping my components safe on that one. 
So the next one is King Domino. So we're stepping it back to fairly simple. Now, this came up before when we did an episode, we were talking about next step games. And this was what we recommended as a next step game to Dominoes. This is a very accessible game. This one's perfect for non-gamers. Everyone pretty much knows how Dominoes work. And even if they don't, it's really simple to explain how to match things. Uh, You're going to draft tiles. Each tile has up to two types of terrain. And when you play, you have to match terrain on the board. You're building a small medieval kingdom that's five by five some of the tiles have crowns on them you're going to try to get score based on the number of crowns versus how much area you have as a color uh, it's very simple to teach very portable but it does take up a bit of room especially having to draft and each player having a five by five area by the end yeah it's not a huge space sink but you'll definitely want some room to start your layout uh, so that you won't have to be moving it around too much once you get started and figure out which way you're building uh super fun super low barrier to entry and next up, now, oh. sorry, I want to yeah. stop in for one second because I did miss something in King Domino. I did mention it's a five by five. There is also an advanced rule. So King Domino no, normally is a four player game and you're all building five by five kingdoms. There is a two player variant where you can each build a seven by seven kingdom. Now that is actually where the game really shines. But by being seven by seven, you need even more room. Right. Next up, medium footprint, medium game time. Combine the last two, need a bit bigger table and a bit more time. Now, have we ever talked about Azul on this show? <laughs> Once or twice. Once or twice. Yeah, this is a tile drafting game that is fantastic two player. Um, our last anniversary, NG Games and I were out in uh, Essex County for three days, and I think we played. 10 games of Azul, at least, if not more. Um, This game does need some room, but what's good about Azul is it doesn't have to be square. Like, you don't need a square table. And what we found Azul fits perfect on is a nice long bar. This game just keeps on giving. Uh, To me, this is really on the edge of small medium. It does need a little bit of space, but not a lot. Uh, For two people, uh, even a small round coffee shop table can can work uh, as long as you manage your space. Yeah, it's iffy. If I remember when we played at Queen City Conquest to fit two people on a table, your board had to kind of hang off the table a bit. It, it's it's iffy, but especially like having to lay the tiles out, it, it might have went up one. Now, the other thing with Azul is playtime. Playtime is very, very dependent on the number of, or the, it's not the number, the experience of the players in AP. There are people who are going to play Azul like this, lightning quick, and you're going to be done in 10 minutes. Then you're going to play that one person where a game takes an hour because they have to count the tiles every turn to make sure they're not getting stuck. And then you don't draft what they wanted, so they have to redo all their math. I have played with both types. I, in general, though, it's half hour or less. But know that some players, if you're playing with them, may take longer, and it is something to consider. Well, flipping the board over probably uh, extends your time. I still haven't played on the on the backside, but you're you're really extending your game out if you're playing on that backside, correct? Yeah, definitely. Uh, there's that. It, although at the beginning it's quicker because there's less to worry about, right? You're not yeah. trying to get it in the right spot, so the the it's it's back loaded. So up next is Le Havre, the Inland Port or Le Havre, or however that one's actually pronounced. I think I'm pronouncing that one right. Same designer as Agricola. So maybe I should try to pronounce them both right. Uh, So if you found Agricola, all creatures, big and small, way too simple, take a look at Le Havre. This is a big box, resource management, economic game, tons of things going on, refining resources and dealing with your own port, distilled down to a small box, quick game time. There is some really brilliant stuff in here using time. And the way the economy is represented, um, when you buy a building, every turn you either buy a building or use a building. But if you wait to use your buildings, to get better. So it's all about figuring out when to build. And then once you build, when to use and when to build new things. And do you let your stuff age? There's tons of decisions. Um, it, it is great if you dig heavier games. So if you want the heavy Euro economic engine building game for two players that you can play in about 45 minutes... Le Havre, the inland port, is where to look. Uh, A number of little tokens, but still quite compact to set up. Players at home might be used to spreading out and taking up more space with with this game, but you really can uh, put it all together tight and keep it uh, into a small amount of space. 
I am going to mention one thing mentioned in the chat by NG Games. The mistake we made the first time playing this is not realizing quite how heavy it was and trying to play it in a hotel room after a night of drinking. This is not a game to try to figure out after having a few pints. Makes sense. So we talked about King Domino. Well, there's a bigger version of that game called Queen Domino. This is a good in-between game. So in between King Domino and in between the inland port, so the light game and the heavy game, is Queen Domino. This king is very simple, very easy to tweet, teach. Queen uses those mechanics. So you got to know everything you need to know to play king, and then it builds on it. And literally builds on it because the biggest thing Queen Domino adds is building buildings from a central market. And to buy those buildings, you need money. And to get money, you need knights that have to go out and tax the land. As you can tell, this is already at least five things added to the base game. This is King Domino for Euro gamers or hobby gamers. It is significantly longer. It does take up more room. But if you didn't find King Domino had enough meat for you, this is a great next step. One great thing I found is that you can uh, combine Queen Domino and King Domino into a single into a single box with uh, purchased or do-it-yourself inserts, and this is a great option if you want to start easy and advance, or uh, or have both options available to you. Yeah, and if I remember, there there are rules to combine the two, and there might even be a two-player one. Like I remember, you, I said you can build a seven by seven. There might be a way to build like a nine by nine kingdom with both. It's not something I've tried. So up next is deck builders deck builders in general are fantastic to player now i will admit ascension is probably my favorite deck builder but for one it takes up a lot of room it has a board and there's all kinds of little bits there's two different resources you at the track and there's little gems and heck the latest expansion for ascension even adds dice so i would leave ascension at home but grab star realms Star Realms is a fantastic rotating market-based deck builder. By rotating market, I mean Dominion, which we talked about earlier. The market's static. It's the same the whole game. Rotating market means when you buy a card, a new card comes out. This is one of the things that where people have improved on Dominion. And even better, Star Realms, you don't even need counters for your health. They give you cards to track your life or honor, it's called in the game. Fantastic game. And, and honestly, you know, I, I just can't. I have a hard time justifying playing physical Ascension. The mobile version of it is just so well implemented. Um, I don't want people to sit on their phones and, and play and play on date night. I, I But if you're going to play Ascension, I, I just can't imagine telling someone to buy that physical game at this point. I, yeah, <laughs> I, I can see that. And to be honest, somewhat the same way with Star Realms. The Star Realms app is fantastic. Actually, most deck builders, you can now get app versions of. So, yeah, it might be worth checking out. And I will admit, I've been on date night. Uh, what Inch Games and I usually do is pass and play. Right. Where I hand her the phone and she hands it back to me. And we played Ascension many times sitting at Jack's Pub. What's good about that is you can save the game, right? Like, so when your food comes... You can't really, like, if you're playing Ascension, you got to clear the board. That's a pain. If you have your phone, you just put your phone down. And then once you guys are done eating, you just pick the phone up. So actually, it's, it's a solid suggestion. Yeah, th and, of, that way you're not, and that way you're not both staring down at your phone. You're, you're actually interacting because you're doing the pass and play and not just both head down, ignoring each other in the physical yeah. world while you play in the uh, virtual. Exactly. And here, I'm going to throw another one in. We have a whole new classification not talked about on the blog. This is why you guys listen live. Uh, is Small World. Small World is not available on phones, but it's available on tablets. And Small World is fantastic with two-player. And there is no way I would ever bring this out of my house. I hate bringing it to the game store because there's so many counters in this game. But the app tracks all of that. And what's nice about that one with the tablet is you just put the tablet between you and it becomes the board. And you just reach over and you take your move and you sit back and your opponent reaches over and takes their move. So that's a very strong two-player recommendation. Again, has the added advantage of when your food comes, you just close your tablet, put it off to the side. And then when you're waiting for the next course, you can open it up and keep playing. So there's another good app recommendation. And uh, Dark Wolf in the uh, chat room mentions Cthulhu Realms is the Mythos version. Same company for the... Uh, love oh, very fans. cool. Yeah, they also do uh, Hero Realms, which is a fantasy-themed one where I guess you have heroes. I personally have only played um, Star Realms, which is why I recommend that one. I have heard the other ones are good. I No, I'm not going to say anything negative about a different game. Stay, I personally, I love Star Realms. If you want to try a fantasy version, try Hero Realms. If you like Mythos, Dark Wolf recommends Cthulhu Realms. 
So now a hat tip to the collectible card game or the living card game or the trading card game or whatever isn't copyrighted you're allowed to call them. I don't play them anymore, but that was like Magic the Gathering was the game when my wife and I were dating. Um, then from Magic, we moved on to Middle Earth, the Wizards. She was obsessed by the Decipher Star Trek game. And for those who are actually living in 2018, uh, Magic is still big. But the new hotness seems to be Keyforge by Richard Garfield, same designer as Magic. Now, some of these deck games can still rarely spread out on the table. Uh, and That's you want to think about your game and game style. And uh, if you'll have enough room, depending on where you're going, uh, you're not going to be able to drop that Pokemon playmat down on a lot of uh, a lot of tables <laughs> somewhere. So just keep that in well, mind and think about where you're going. Yeah, I do find most people playing Pokemon, most adults playing Pokemon aren't using the mats anymore. They've kind of condensed it down. So up next, large footprints, medium game time. Now, by large, I don't mean huge. I mean big for a bar or restaurant or coffee shop. I'm not saying you need an 8x4 game table, but you probably want a full 3x3 three three area cleared off to play these games. Now, here's where I put another game I mention all the time because it's one of my favorite games, and that's Race for the Galaxy. Now, it doesn't look like it needs a lot of room because it's just a deck of cards, but then you start building that tableau. With two players, you need room for the deck and up to 24 cards laid out in front of people with a bit of space to be able to tuck other cards underneath them to represent resources. So it takes room. And then you also have the victory point chips. And then if you're using the expansions, which please use the Gathering Storm expansion, it makes the game way better, you also have other bits you're going to need on the table. Now, this is a card base for X game and one of my favorite games of all time. And yes, I know I usually say that that special rules for two players are horrible and it shouldn't exist. This is a game where a two-player variant exists and works. All it is is you take two actions a turn instead of one. Now, we've even played this three-player in a small square as long as it was free of impediments. So, you know, you really, you can fit this into smaller tables, but yeah, it, can, uh, it can take up, you, you, you know, you're not going to be playing this on the small rounds, the tiny little, uh, the tiny little bar rounds. Very true. Uh, up next, Carcassonne. This is a classic for a good reason. I actually think this game is best with two players. It's much more cutthroat a game than it seems like at first. Actually, for Kark, I feel there's an evolution with this game, a, a way gameplay evolves. Like, when you first start playing the game, it's almost co-op, right? Like, you draw your tile, and you show everyone else, you all know, kind of tile, oh, that'll fade over here, oh, that'll fit there. And it, it, it's, you're just, people are going to suggest where to play it. And then as you play more Kark, it becomes multiplayer solitaire, right? Where people grab their tile, and they don't want to show anyone else, and they make their own move, and like, ha, ah, I got this. And they're just trying to build this really long road, or this really big castle, or they're trying to get their cloisters all surrounded. And then all of a sudden, after enough plays, and this is different depending on the person, it suddenly clicks, and your focus becomes more watching what the other players do. Someone else is building a nice big city? Huh, time to steal it. Oh, that's a nice big road you have there. How about we share those points instead of you having all of those? And man, the competition for farms can be fierce. This is where I think Carcassonne shines, when you have a group of players, or in this case, you and your partner, are both equally good at the game, and it becomes this dance of trying to get the points for yourself and stop your opponents from stealing them. And it's, it's a brilliant game once you get past that basic level. You know, it's meeple and tiles, low piece management with a good pace, even if you're playing for a half an hour to 45 minutes per game. Uh, what I would watch out for is uh, if you've got one of the fancy 3D pieces, this is probably not one you're going to want to bring yeah, bring out no. uh, that. But man, I ran in, I hadn't run into those before today. And God, are some of those gorgeous. The 3D yeah, Carcassonne piece. Some. Wow. The only thing I don't get is how do you draft them? Like, uh, like. I assume I assume draft they, with the normal tiles I assume you must the draft with the normal the and then 3D and then grab the 3D appropriate one because it just looks gorgeous on the table. Like they look cool. I just practically I don't see how you can play Kark with 3D tiles. <laughs> I think that's more of a con thing to show it off. Right. But yeah, Kark. The other thing with Kark is I personally find um, the expansions add bloat, especially if you throw way too many of them in. I just stick to the base game, especially if you're just out on date night. Keep it simple. Um, up next, Seven Wonders Duel. Seven Wonders is a really good empire building game that plays fantastic with three to seven players, but not so great with two. 
So much so that it had silly two-player variant rules that the designer hated so much that he started working with another designer to put out a two-player version of the game. Um, it's all the drafting fun of the original game with, with only two players. This is Seven Wonders Duel. Uh, it's a bit more epic than the original, so it scales out a bit. Instead of just playing one, like you're not just building one wonder, all seven of the wonders are in the game, and one of the game end conditions is all seven get built. Now, there's only two players, so that means one person's going to have more wonders than the other. Uh, you're still going to play through three areas of gameplay. You can win by military victory. You can win by science. Really cool game. Distills down seven wonders excellently. But, man, it takes a lot of room because the way drafting is represented in this is you lay out your cards like the solitaire game pyramid where you can't reach the cards at the top until you've gotten rid of the cards at the bottom. And to make it so you don't have perfect information, each row of cards are flipped. So you have a row of face-up cards and then... Between those cards, a row of face-down cards, and then a row of face-up cards. And every era, the pattern's different, but the pattern always takes up quite a bit of room. If you enjoy Seven Wonders, it's unlikely that you'll be disappointed by this uh, excellent implementation. Mm -hmm. So there are two-player, large footprint, long games I feel I have to mention. Now, I'm only mentioning these because I've actually played them with my wife on date night. These are not games I would generally recommend playing on date night, but I feel because I have, I should probably mention them. So when Enchi Games and I get a hotel room, when we're booking a hotel room, we actually do research and we love 3D look arounds on the web. That's please, more companies do that because we're looking for a table to play games on. We've also taken apart tables in the room. Like, you know how you go in, there's always that table under the TV. Years ago, the TV used to be on it. Now it's usually mounted on the wall. Sometimes it's still on it. We have moved the TV and moved the coffee maker and moved the millions of magazines and all the local menus off so that you can have a table free. No, the tabletop bellhop does not encourage or recommend the disassembling of portions of private property in order to play games. We do it, but you shouldn't. We know you will anyways, but we have to say this. It's disassembled, but put back before we leave. We are nice enough. We're not making the, the staff come in and reset everything up. Before we leave the hotel, everything's back in its place. So one example of this was we were in London, Ontario, and we broke out Fields of Arl. This is an Uwe Rosenberg farming game specifically made for two players. This is a meaty, heavy Euro. This was... Uve going, you know, Agricola is great, but it's not so great two players. Yeah, we put out the two player big and small, but we want that feel of Agricola, Agricola. We want that big game feel. So we're going to put one out just for two players. This is a worker placement with multiple seasons. Upgrade your tools, cut peat, refine goods, sell goods to neighboring cities. Lots going on. Brain burning goodness that takes up a ridiculous amount of room because each player has their own playboard. Each player has their own warehouse. There's a huge central market. There's got to be a thousand chits in this game. It's a great heavy game. Two hours of playtime, five years of game time, probably not for your first few dates. Yes, very true. This is, this is, this is a big game. Like I said, the, the only reason this is on this list is because I have played it on a date night. So the last suggestion for me, again, only because we played this once. Actually, more than once. Uh, it's not something I normally recommend. We played this four times on our last anniversary. Our last anniversary weekend spent in Kingsville. Uh, we played in the hotel room. We played at a restaurant. And then we played in an awesome coffee shop that sadly is now under new owners called Merley's. And that is Fallout the board game. I have talked about my love-hate relationship with this game at this time we were deeply in love with this game. Uh, this is a game where you're basically playing through Fallout. You're going to pick a scenario. You're going to explore the wasteland. You're going to have encounters. Big, heavy fantasy. Heavy, different than... Not heavy as in hard decisions, but heavy as in lots of options, lots of chits, lots of ways things can happen. Two different types of weight, I guess. I probably didn't clarify that very well. So Fields of Arrow is hard decisions. Follow, it's not hard decisions, just lots of choices. I really dig this game. We had a ton. I actually think it may be best with two players, although I have heard it's actually best with one, but I haven't tried with one player. This, We, we had a ton of fun with this game. There are probably any number of jokes I could make involving hotel rooms and Fallout. I'll <laughs> leave, the, uh, leave those to the chat room to indulge in. We've talked about Fallout. It's good, it's bad, and it's come up any number of times now. 
So I'm going to finish up with a few honorable mentions. These are not games I've played. So one of the ones that comes up, if you Google two-player date night, couple, relationship game, so on, you're going to find this new game called Fog of Love. Uh, this is so new, I haven't even gotten to try it. I haven't been able to pick it up. Uh, the people's voice means anything to you. I do suggest checking out Fog of Love. I've dug into this one a little bit, and uh, the term emotional landmines came up several times. Uh, while you are playing made-up characters, it can be tough sometimes to separate our fantasy from our reality. And while open communication is absolutely vital in a relationship, a game like this may not be the way everyone should go about achieving that. Uh, apparently, it occasionally has uh, caused things to come out uh, <laughs> suddenly and, in uh, you know, cause some problems. So it's just one of those games where you just think about uh, think about who you're playing with it and uh, at what sort of depth you want to get into them with uh, before you bring it out. Interesting. So I've heard, uh, like, the many role-playing games have what we call bleed or what people call bleed which is where things happen in game and it spills out to your real life. I had no idea there was a board game that also has bleed. Now I know. So the next one is war games. Now I'm talking hex encounter, mini games, whatever. Most of these are designed for two players. They're not really my jam. When I do feel like playing them, it's not date night. That's just not what I go for. Now over the years, my wife and I have enjoyed Twi Twilight Struggle. Uh, Hammer of the Scots, and Command and Color Ancients. Those are three of our favorites. Uh, besides having to be in the right mood, though, these games are notorious for lots of chits and counters and cubes. And to me, they're not great for public play. Not really my thing, but to each their own. Again, inserts. Um, if, you're, if, you're, if you're a war gamer, you're probably already uh, going to be well involved in the inserts and, and peace management system. It's just so much more important when you're out in public. Very true. Where they got the counter trays, right? That's the big Warhammer or War game thing. So lastly, I do have to give a nod to the adult games. The end of Gate Night games. Uh, your triple X Monopoly, the wide number of dice showing either positions or activities for you and your partner to try. Uh, the card game 1000 Sex Games that includes lots of ways to spice up the night. Now I'm going to hold back on the recommendations here and let you discover this category on your own. Now, I just want to throw out that you need to be aware of this category as many of the games involved in it are novelty games that aren't games so much as throwaway garbage. Um, mm. They're generally designed for, for non-gamers non and have uh, little to no replay value whatsoever. That doesn't mean you may not. They may not be fun for uh, a one-off as it may be, but do your research and... Uh, I don't expect a lot of quality gaming out of uh, this category necessarily. Now you will find these games on Board Game Geek. So just like any other game, go there. If it says player count one, you may want to skip that game on date night. There we go. Uh, so now, now that we're through our main topic, we're going to check back in with our lobby for their thoughts on what we've been talking about. And Dark Wolf has asked about the Tiny Epic Games. Uh, to be honest, I've only ever played one Tiny Epic game. It was Tiny Epic Zombies, and I shared my thoughts on that. For one, I'm not a fan of the genre, which probably colors my opinion of the game, but I found it not the best game with a broken rule book, and I don't see how it'd be any better two-player than it was when I played four-player. Yeah, beyond that, we've had a lot of discussion uh, going along, matching up with us. Uh, a lot of... Uh comments again with magic where you forget just how big it can take it can be uh you know magic spreads so much faster yes. than a lot of people think uh, yeah when i when i mentioned it on the blog and i noted unless you're playing against my one one white deck that you would need a little more room i do notice a lot of the tiny epic games are uh, are often uh three and four players um best yeah at best so I've been curious about the game. Like, to be honest, the main reason I haven't checked them out is they don't go on sale and I don't tend to pay full price for my games. So that's one of the things that stops me from trying them. All right. Well, this was a great talk. Be sure to check out the blog at tabletopbellhop.com and click on Gaming Advice for other questions answered in blog form. 
be sure to send us your questions over on the website under Ask the Bellhop or email us at questions at tabletopbellhop.com. And a reminder that Patreon patrons at the Good Tip or Better level get their questions bumped to the top. Speaking of our Patreon, a shout out and a thank you to our backers. Their support helps make this show possible. Uh, Misdirected Mark, join Bob, Chris, and Phil every Tuesday night at 8.45 Eastern right here on Twitch as they talk games and game mastering. They're currently going through a series where they are exploring Numenera by Monty Cook Games. Brian Kurtz, thank you. Duran Barnett, thank you for joining us. Joe Swick, thank you. Steve D, I haven't seen you tonight. What happened to Steve D? I hope he's okay. Kitchen didn't catch on fire. Jeff Zeus, good luck getting players for that DCC open table. Well, that was the double bell. That means my shift is coming to an end and we're going to have to lock the front doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us across the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Drop by our website at tabletopbellhop.com for more gaming content. If you like the content we're providing here at Tabletop Bellhop and would like to support our efforts, please consider tipping the bellhop at patreon.com forward slash tabletop bellhop. And I won't mention this this episode, but probably not any future episodes. We are also now on Pod Pledge. We have a coffee account and you can PayPal donate to us. Uh, for links to all those, check out the webpage and look down the right side. Personally, I dig Patreon and would prefer to keep everything in one place, keep all the money in one pot but if people don't like them for various reasons i get that and if you want to support us we want you to be able to do that so we are other places remember to join us on twitch every wednesday night at 9 30 p.m eastern and watch for the tabletop bellhop live to hit your podcatchers and youtube at 2 a.m eastern every tuesday well that about wraps up the time we have for the show tonight for those of you here live thank you for joining us we'd like to invite you to hang around and join us in the pendo suite for an off the books after show for tabletop bellhop live i'm sean and I'm Mo. Thank you. And game on.